On Sunday mornings, Pastor Kakuza has been going verse by verse through the book of Matthew, and it's been a terrific series. Um, if you're new today, make sure you come back next week. You do not want to miss it. It's a very practical series, especially recently as he's been covering the Sermon on the Mount, a message that Jesus himself preached. So again, you don't want to miss it. Today, I'm not going to preach from the book of Matthew, but I, heard, I had you turn to that first chapter because we're going to look at someone who is found in the lineage of Jesus Christ. This is a person you wouldn't expect to find in the family tree of the Messiah because this lady did not come from a great background. To our knowledge, she did not come from a prestigious family. On top of that, her husband passed away while she was still relatively young. And she ended up moving away from all that she had ever known. But God was able to use her and bless her life because of the choices that she herself made. She followed God's known will. Of course, the person I'm describing is Ruth. The book of Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And some of the greatest heroes of the faith are found in this list. At the same time, there are a few unexpected names. One of those unexpected names is a woman from Moab. If you're not familiar with the Moabites, um, you, you could find them talked about earlier on in the Bible. Uh, they come from a very sinful history filled with all sorts of wickedness. They're descendants of Lot, Abraham's nephew. Today we have a term for a family that's not operating the way God intended. We would call it a dysfunctional family. A dysfunctional family. Now, of course, no family is perfect because Jesus Christ is the only perfect one. And Jesus never got married. So then that means that every dad is a sinner, every mom is a sinner, and every child is a sinner. But by the grace of God and by following the teachings of Scripture, we can know what God wants us to do. And in that, we can have a happy God-honoring home. Uh, by the way, if you're looking for a better family, may I encourage you uh, that you either listen to or watch Pastor Kakuza's series, God, Your Family, and You. It's a tremendous series you can find on YouTube and pretty much any podcast platform that's out there. And it can have a huge positive impact on your marriage and on the way you raise your children, all sorts of things like that. But while it's true that there is no such thing as a perfect family, at the same time, it's also true that there is such a thing as a dysfunctional family. And one of the most dysfunctional families in the entire Bible was Lot's family. As two of Lot's own daughters got their dad drunk for the purpose of committing incest with him so that they could have children of their own. Uh, talk about dysfunction. Well, one of the children who was born from that relationship was a boy that they named Moab. He was the father of the Moabites. And as, the, as if the beginning of the Moabites wasn't bad enough, they then continue in their sinful ways uh, to the point that they actually started creating false gods. And not only did they create them, they influenced nations around them to worship these false gods. And eventually they became the enemies of Israel. So you can understand then why I would say that you wouldn't expect anyone from this heritage, this lineage, to be in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And yet, there Ruth is in Matthew 1, verse 5. It says, And Salmon begat Booz, or Boaz, of Rakam, Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. Ruth, there she is. Last Sunday night, we covered several practical takeaways from Ruth's life. If you've never read the book of Ruth for yourself, I'd highly encourage you to do that this week. It's not a very long book of the Bible. It's only four chapters in length. It won't take much time to read. And the book of Ruth is such a beautiful picture of redemption. It's a beautiful true story of redemption. As we see God working in the affairs of humanity. All the way from chapter 1 into the fourth chapter, you see God's hand at work. Now, while God is at work, at the same time, God has given man a free will. And man can make good choices, or with that, God can, uh, man can make bad choices. And we see that even within this book. As one Israelite family chose to leave the promised land because there was a famine. And of all the places to go to, they chose the land of Moab. Not too long after that, the father tragically passes away. And then shortly after that, each of the two boys ends up marrying a woman from Moab. One of those women being Ruth, the main character. 
Shortly after that, each of the boys passes away, and it's at that time when their mom, Naomi, decides, I want to head back to my homeland. I want to go back to Israel. And specifically, she wants to go to her hometown of Bethlehem. And so it's at that point where she encourages her two daughters-in-law to stay where they're at. Stay in the land of Moab. Stay with your families. However, Ruth was so committed to doing what was right, she didn't want to leave her mother-in-law. She said, no, I'm going to go with you. I want to do what's right. I want to serve your God. And we see this in Ruth 1. Look at verses 16 and 18. Hopefully you, you turned to that spot there. Ruth chapter 1. As it's here where we find some of the greatest lines in this book, and really some of the greatest lines spoken by any human in the entire Bible. These verses also show us why God blessed Ruth to the extent that he did. Ruth 1, look at verse 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Talk about loyalty. Talk about doing what is right. Ruth had the correct mindset, a mindset of putting other people first. This is the mindset we see of Christ that's talked about other places in Scripture, that we are to be, uh, have the mindset of a humble servant. And we see that here in Ruth. And Ruth not only gives this very moving speech, but then she follows it up with action. And she moves with Naomi back to Israel and helps her mother-in-law. One of the practical takeaways that we saw last week was the fact that your past does not need to determine your future. Your past does not need to determine your future. No, you can't control the family you were born into or the time period you were born or the place that you were born. But what you can control are the decisions you're making today. You can control the direction that your life is heading based on those choices. And Ruth is such a terrific example of this. She was able to follow God's known will in her life. But how did she do it? Well, simply put, she trusted God. She had faith in God. In fact, she had so much faith in God that everyone around her was able to start noticing the faith that she had. And on top of that, she did what was right. Maybe she didn't know every step of her future, but she knew the next step that God wanted her to take. And she took it. And then God showed her the next step and the next one after that. And it was just one day at a time, one moment at a time. And on top of that, she worked hard. She worked willingly. She received counsel. And she did everything that the counsel had recommended. In that, we found that Ruth had the right mindset. And that led her to having the right actions, which ultimately led to the right results. Which brings us to this morning's message as, as we look at the kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer. There are so many beautiful parallels between Boaz and Jesus Christ. If you read the book of Ruth without understanding what a kinsman redeemer is, uh, it's very likely you'll miss the depth of this section of scripture, the, the beauty that's found in this true story. And I hope you'll understand it by the end of this morning's message. All of this, though, begs the question, what is a kinsman redeemer? What is a kinsman redeemer? To answer that question, I'm going to have you turn to the book of Leviticus. Hold your spot in Ruth. We're going to come right back to it. But Leviticus chapter 25 talks about this kinsman redeemer. In Leviticus 25, 25, we find God giving the Israelites the Mosaic law. Moses is at Mount Sinai. He's receiving it from God. And Leviticus 25, verse 25 tells us this. If thy brother be waxing poor and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. In its simplest terms, to redeem means to buy back. To buy back. Now keep in mind, God was the one who had given Israel their promised land. This was an inheritance from God. It was not something that any person would want to give up. But under extreme situations, if a person needed to pay off a debt or didn't have enough to feed their family or, or to take care of their family's needs, they could sell their land. Even in those situations, though, God set it up within the law where a family could gain their land back. 
They could get their inheritance back, which God had originally given them. And there was a number of ways that this could happen. Those are talked about in Leviticus 25. One of those ways being through a kinsman redeemer. By definition, a kinsman redeemer was a relative who at his own expense would pay off the debt of another. He had to be a close relative who would then buy back what was lost. And this was not just something that anyone could do. It also wasn't something that could be taken lightly. This was a very serious endeavor. And we'll see that here in a little bit as there were several necessary requirements for a person who wanted to fulfill this role. Now, as I've shared with you, Naomi had lost her husband and both of her sons. Can you imagine being in her shoes? Just how tragic that must have been, how, how horrible that whole situation was. However, it was even worse than we understand on the surface level because in their culture at that time period, there were few things worse than being a widow with no sons. As one author put it, to be in that situation meant the loss of income and support. It usually meant the loss of possessions. And ultimately, it usually resulted in the loss of your property. So in short, Ruth and Naomi had a great need. They had a tremendous need. The only hope they had was for someone to see their situation and willingly step in and help them. And that is where Boaz enters the picture. I think you can probably begin to see the parallels between Naomi and us. I'm going to have you hold your spot there in Ruth. I, I know I, I keep going back and forth different passages. We're going to look really quick at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, because the first verses of Ephesians chapter 2 show us our situation of what it was like before we were saved. It shows us what it was like to be lost. Now, if you're like me, you might not have much of a memory of, of what it was like before you were saved. I got saved at a very young age. I think I was about four or five years old. And my preschool teacher at the time had shared the good news of salvation with the class. She told us that we'd all done wrong. Uh, we've all, you know, been mean to our brothers and sisters, or we said something we shouldn't. Maybe we've told a lie, or, or we've hit someone. We've done something we shouldn't. And uh, that sin will then cause us to end up in hell. We all deserve to spend time in hell, eternity in hell. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. And as my teacher explained it, Jesus Christ came down to this earth. He took our place on the cross. He paid our sin debt. My teacher explained that with the wordless book. And it's at that time when I placed my faith in Christ to save me. So again, maybe you're like me where you don't have uh, much of a memory of what it was like before you were saved, but maybe you do. Just out of curiosity, how many of you were saved from five years old or younger? Okay, a, a decent number of people. How many of you were saved between the ages of six and 20? A lot more people. Okay, how many between the ages of 21 and 50? That's probably most of the people. And uh, how about anyone after the age of 51? Anyone saved after 51? That's amazing. It's amazing to see God work in everyone's lives. So maybe you're not like me and you can remember what life was like before you were saved. Well, we see that here in Ephesians 2 as what Paul does in this passage is paint a vivid contrast between what life was like when we were sinners, when we, were, uh, we had no hope but then also what life is like under grace, what God has done for us. In Ephesians 2, we immediately see our terrible situation. Look at verse 1. It says, And you hath he quickened or made alive. Who is this? Well, it's those who were dead in trespasses and sins. Because of our sin, we are spiritually dead. God cannot allow any sin into his perfect heaven. Our sin separates us from God. The wages of sin is death. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. And due to our sin, we deserve to spend an eternity separated from God in a literal place called hell. Talk about a terrible situation. This is the worst situation, a problem that any person will ever face. That continues in verse 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also... We had our conversation or, or our lifestyle in times past in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So again, from these first three verses, we can see we had a huge problem. We are sinners. We, in and of ourselves, have no hope, just like Naomi here. 
We needed someone to step in. We needed someone to redeem us and pay the price for us. And of course, God stepped in. He paid that price for you and for me and for the entire world. Every person who's ever lived. Two of the greatest words in the Bible are found at the beginning of Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God. But God. Yes, we had no hope. We could not save ourselves. We did not deserve it. We did not earn it. But God. He did something for us. Whenever you see that word but in the Bible, it's referring to a change or, or a turnaround of an idea. Again, we're sinners. There's no hope in and of ourselves, but there's been a change. We see a similar idea in Romans chapter 5. Verse 8 of that chapter says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the exact same train of thought that we find in Ephesians chapter 2. Yes, we're sinners, but God, he did something for us. And uh, we see there God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. So God is rich. He's wealthy in mercy. There's enough for all of us. And he has great love that he demonstrated for us. Just as Boaz stepped in to help Naomi and Ruth, so God stepped in to help you and me. We were lost in our sinful condition. And as we look at this uh, story of Ruth, this true story, I hope you see the beautiful parallels between her situation and our situation. Speaking of which, let's go back to the book of Ruth, where we left Ruth and Naomi in quite the predicament. They needed someone to step in and help them. And again, that's where Boaz enters the picture. As I mentioned, there were several strict requirements if a person wanted to fulfill the role of a kinsman redeemer. Each of these requirements is a point on your verse sheet there. And if you're following along, you can fill in these blanks. First of all, we see that the kinsman redeemer had to be a near king. He had to be a near king. You had to be related. You had to be from the same family. Someone from a different family could not step in and fulfill this role. And Boaz met this requirement. As Ruth 2 verse 1 says, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech. Elimelech is her husband, and his name was Boaz. So Boaz was a near king to Naomi. And in this, we see the first parallel between Jesus Christ and Boaz. The scriptures tell us in both the Old and New Testaments that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or no forgiveness of sins. So in order to pay the required price for our sin, God would have to take on human flesh so that he could shed his blood for us. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. He became one of us, just as we find in John 1.14. And the word was made flesh. What a powerful statement. God the Son took on flesh for us. That is incredible. He dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, took on flesh. He was still fully God. And at the same time, he was perfect man. By doing this, Christ was able to redeem us. We've seen that the kinsman redeemer had to be a near king. We also find, number two, that the kinsman redeemer had to be willing he had to be willing. And in the case of Ruth, there was actually another man, a closer relative than Boaz, who had the first opportunity to be that kinsman redeemer. However, if a person was not willing, they could not be forced to fulfill the role. It was a very serious undertaking. And so you could not force the person to do it. And that closer relative was not willing. He did not want to make the necessary sacrifice. We'll read about that shortly. But first, let's look at someone who was willing. And of course, that was Boaz. The second requirement really gets to the heart of the kinsman redeemer. Being willing was what it was all about. And we also see this in our redeemer, Jesus Christ. 1 John 3.16 tells us that Jesus laid down his life for us. He gave his life for us. As Jesus himself said in John 10, 10, 18, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. 
I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So Jesus Christ willingly sacrificed his life for us. No one forced him to do it. He did it of his own accord. Again, what a beautiful parallel between Boaz and Jesus Christ. Now that being said, while a, uh, being willing, being willing got to the heart of the kinsman redeemer, what good was it if a person was willing, but they were not able? They had no ability to pay off the necessary price. Which brings us to our third requirement here. Number three, the kinsman redeemer had to be able. He had to be able. Willingness alone was not enough. If you did not have the financial means to pay the price, what good was it? You could have the best intentions in the world. That's great. But good intentions alone are not enough. You had to be able. You had to step up and pay the necessary price. And in the case of Boaz, not only was he willing, but he was more than able. He was a wealthy man. And because of that, he was able to pay off the debt that Ruth and Naomi had. So likewise, Jesus Christ was able to pay the price for our redemption. There's a big word in the Bible that describes this. It's the word propitiation. Propitiation, it means satisfactory payment. It says in 1 John 4, 10, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the satisfactory payment for our sin. So God is able. He was able to pay that satisfactory price. Earlier in that same book, the book, the book of 1 John, we're told in chapter 2, verse 2, and he, Jesus Christ, is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So he's not only able to pay the, our sins, he's able to pay the price for the sins of the whole world. Every person who has ever lived. And by the way, that does away with Calvinism, doesn't it? The whole world, anyone can be saved because Jesus has paid the price for everyone. He was that satisfactory payment. And not only was Christ able, but he took it a step further and he paid the price in full. Which gets us to that fourth and final requirement of the kinsman redeemer. So far we've seen that the kinsman redeemer had to be a near king. He had to be willing and he had to be able. Number four, the kinsman redeemer had to pay the price in full. He had to pay the price in full. There was no such thing as a partial redemption. By the very nature of the situation, if a person was so destitute that they needed a kinsman redeemer, that meant they didn't have anything. They had nothing for which to pay. Nothing they could do would be good enough. And we see this in the example of Ruth. This truly was an all or nothing proposition on the part of Boaz. And Boaz stepped up. He willingly paid the price and he paid it in full. In all of this, you can see that Boaz was a type of Jesus Christ. You know, the more I study the word of God, the more amazed I am by the fact that God is so clear. Eternal salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. And he paid the full price for our sins. Salvation is not based on what we can do. There's nothing good that we can do to earn it or, or to merit it. The God of the universe not only created us, which in and of itself is incredible enough, but then he took it a step further. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the price in full for you and for me. Jesus Christ redeemed us and he's left us nothing left to pay. That is why Christ died on the cross. It was to pay our sin debt. And as Jesus himself said, it is finished. There's nothing more to do. It's already been done. The work has been done on Calvary because Jesus paid the price in full. And not only did he die, but then he was buried and he rose again, proving that the payment had been accepted. It was done. It was taken care of. And now God offers eternal salvation as a free gift. No strings attached. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. And the way we receive this free gift is through faith. As Jesus himself said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, anyone, everyone can put their faith in him. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but instead you'll have everlasting life. That moment we believe is the moment that we hold, that we possess 
everlasting life. And if it's everlasting, how long is it? It's forever, right? You have it, you have it right now, you have it forever. Unfortunately, this good news is a foreign concept to so many people because they want to work, they want to earn salvation. The problem with that is, number one, good works are not the requirement to pay off the sin debt. A blood payment had to be made, a perfect blood payment, and that's exactly what Jesus did for us. On top of that, the payment has already been made in full. There's nothing left to pay. And so many people don't understand this. Really what it boils down to is that people don't understand grace. Grace means unmerited favor, undeserved kindness. If you could do something good enough to earn salvation, it would not be grace. It would be earned. But Christ has already paid the price and he paid it in full. So in this, you can see uh, all four of these requirements. Jesus Christ was our kinsman redeemer. What a beautiful picture and what a beautiful parallel between Boaz and him. It's a beautiful picture we find in the book of Ruth. Boaz met all these necessary requirements. However, as I mentioned earlier, there was a closer relative who had the opportunity to make that, pe- that, uh, that payment. And Boaz knew this. Because Boaz was a man of honor and integrity, he wanted to do things the right way. And in all honesty, he did not. In a real sense, he could not make that payment until he met the demands of the law, which is exactly what we find Boaz doing in the beginning of Ruth chapter 4. If you're not there, go back to Ruth. Look at Ruth chapter 4, as we'll pick up in verse 1. As Boaz gives this closer relative the opportunity to step in, to willingly pay the price of redemption. Ruth 4 verse 1. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. In ancient times, the main gate was usually where official business took place. This is where the townspeople would meet. They'd they'd converse with one another. They'd buy and share goods. They'd learn what was going on in the rest of the community. And it was also here where they would settle legal matters. The gate made a great location because there were so many witnesses around that were available. And we see that here in this situation. Boaz had 10 witnesses. Under ordinary circumstances, two or three, two or three witnesses would suffice. That would be more than enough. But the Jewish custom was that if you were to do some uh, great transaction, such as something that involved the transfer of property or a marriage, it was recommended that you had 10 witnesses. The reason for this was because there were very few written records kept. And so you needed more witnesses to be there to add credibility to the transaction. Well, in Ruth 4, Boaz goes on to explain the plight to this closer relative. And the near kinsman was willing to buy the land. He wanted that piece of property, but he was not willing to pay the price of what was required to then marry Ruth. He did not want to marry her. And this guy provides explanation in verse 6. Ruth 4, verse 6, the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou mine right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. So this guy says, I cannot do it. You do it yourself. Boaz, you can take care of this. It's fascinating to to me that this man is simply known as the kinsman. We're never given his proper name. He was so worried about preserving his inheritance, and yet today we don't even know what his name was. On the flip side, Boaz was willing to help. He was willing to be that kinsman redeemer. Look at verse 9. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilion's and Malin's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malin, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his, his, this place. Ye are witnesses this day. So in Mary and Ruth... Boaz became her kinsman redeemer. The book of Ruth begins on such a sad note as it begins with three funerals, but then it ends on such a positive note with a marriage and the birth of a child. 
Because not only did Ruth and Boaz end up getting married, but then they ended up later on having a child. And a, a very unlikely scenario when you consider her origins. Because not only did Ruth uh, end up having that child, but she ended up becoming the great-grandmother of King David. Again, a very unlikely situation when you consider where she began her life. It shows us that God can use anyone. We simply have to be willing. God will use us if we are willing. This brings us full back to where we began this message. Your past does not need to determine your future. Turn with me to, again to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, we've seen that Ruth became the great-grandmother of David. And of course, in that, she would uh, become one of the relatives, one of, part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Matthew 1, look at verse 1. It says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Skip down to verse 5. Yeah, this is one that we've read already. Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David the king. And then I'm going to have you jump all the way down to verse 16 where we find the end of this genealogy. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So we see that Ruth was greatly blessed by God. And not only was she blessed by God, but every person who's ever lived has been blessed by God because of her, because she was able to be part of this genealogy. What an honor. What a privilege. Boaz was that kinsman redeemer. He was a near king. He also was willing. He was able. And he paid the price in full. Again, what a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. This morning, we've seen the amazing incredible love of God, a love so great that even though God knew mankind would sing, God had a plan of salvation in place before man ever sinned. God the Father sent his son to be the savior of the world. And Jesus Christ paid that price we could never pay. He paid it with his own perfect blood. He shed his blood for us. He paid it in full, leaving us nothing left to pay. He redeemed us. Let me illustrate it this way. We do this in pretty much every service because this is the clearest way we know how to share this message of salvation. Let this hand represent you and me and the entire world. Every person who's ever lived, we've all sinned. We've all done wrong. Not only have we committed sin, but we're also born with a sin nature. That's why no natural human could be the Savior. It had to be God who stepped in to do that for us. But we see here that God loves us. God so loved the world. At the same time, God hates our sin. To get to heaven, we have to be rid of our sin. There's nothing good we can do in and of ourselves to save us. As it says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we read Ephesians 2, the beginning of the chapter, but later on it explains how you can be saved. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. A lot of people think by taking the Lord's Supper or by getting water baptized or by attending a particular church, that will help them get to heaven. But God says, no, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're in quite the predicament. God loved us. God hates our sin. We cannot get to heaven with our sin and we can't save ourselves. Let this hand represent the Lord Jesus Christ. He had no sin. He was and is perfect. He came to this earth. He took on flesh for us. He willingly went to the cross. He paid the price for our sins and he paid it in full. There's nothing left for you and I to pay. That payment becomes good on our part the moment we place our faith in Jesus alone to save us. We're saved by faith, believing on Christ and that payment he made for our sins. If you've never placed your faith in Christ alone to save you, you don't want to wait. If you remain in that condition, you will be lost forever in hell. But that's not how God wanted it. That's why he's created this plan of salvation. Christ shed his own blood for us. And in that, he obtained eternal redemption for us. Listen to this. As Hebrews 9.12 states, By his own blood, Jesus Christ entered in once. He made the payment one time and that was enough. Into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ took care of the price 
and it, it was good forever. There are so many verses in the Bible that deal with eternal security, which, by the way, is not a separate doctrine of salvation. They're one and the same. You are saved, you are saved forever. John 10, 28 is one of my favorite verses. It tells us that we have eternal life, we will never perish, and no one can pluck us out of God's hands. 1 John 5, 13 tells us that we can know we have everlasting life. We know it and we can have it. Uh, we have it forever. And even beyond that, Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of redemption. The list of verses could go on and on and on. But Hebrews 9, 12 might be one of the strongest verses in the entire Bible when it comes to this topic of eternal security. Because a payment had to be made for our sins. We could not do it ourselves. Jesus Christ paid that price for us. He did it willingly. He paid it and he paid it in full, obtaining eternal redemption for you and for me, for the entire world. Even a child understands what that word eternal means. It means forever. You have it. And you receive that free gift by faith. If you're here today and you've never trusted in Jesus alone to save you, again, don't wait. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We've been redeemed. We've been redeemed forever. Would you bow with me as we'll wrap up this portion of the service in prayer? Before we do, though, um, I'd like to ask you today, uh, this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed, if this morning was the first time you placed your faith in Jesus alone to save you, I want to pray for you. Me praying for you does not help you get to heaven. Nothing that we can do in and of ourselves gets us to heaven. It's what Jesus has already done. He paid the price. We've seen that this morning. And uh, again, if today was the first time you've trusted in Christ alone to save you, would you signify that with an uplifted hand? Anyone here who's placed their faith in Jesus today for the first time? Anyone at all? Father, we're so grateful for your word, which shows us the way of salvation. And, and it's very clear, all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament, person was saved by faith alone, either in the Messiah that was to come or the Messiah that's already come. We thank you for this beautiful picture that we have here of Ruth and Boaz and all that transpired. And we thank you again that you willingly paid the price for our sins. Be with us now. Help us to make right choices, not to be saved or to stay saved. But now that you have saved us and we have eternal redemption, we pray that we'd want to live our lives for you so that we can have peace, we can have joy, we can have rewards once we get to heaven. And uh, be with us as we see here with Ruth that our past doesn't need to determine our future. We can make good choices starting today. It's in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.